The Unshackled Waves, episode 156. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. What a week of drama in Australian politics. We've now seen the much-anticipated paid interview with former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce and his new partner Vicky Campion on Seven Sunday Night, which has certainly caused a political stir both before and after its airing. One Nation suffered another implosion this week with leader Pauline Hanson falling out with a New South Wales Senator Brian Burston after he decided to defy her and vote for the government's company tax cuts. Now she wants him out of Parliament. The political drama queen herself, Michaela Cash, was in the news again. This time she was subpoenaed to give evidence in the federal court over her officers' involvement in the media tip-off of the AFP raids on the AWU officers last year. Tommy Robinson is still imprisoned in the UK. We hope that he's safe. The reporting ban on him was lifted. There is worldwide support for him with rallies here in Australia and elsewhere, but it's a shame not all on the right are standing with him. To digest this all, I'm joined once again by the Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, you and I, we've just uh, finished watching the exclusive tell-all uh, Barnaby Joyce and Vicky Campion interview on Channel 7 Sunday night, in which they were paid uh, $150,000. Now, we were told uh, before this went to air and uh, on the TV show itself that this would be going into a trust fund for their uh, son, S Sebastian, and uh, their justification on the, on the show was that uh, given everyone else's uh, profiting uh, uh, from uh, uh, Sebastian's uh, birth and uh, uh, since it was revealed that Vicky was pregnant that surely he should uh, uh, get some of it. I'm not sure if, I, I guess it's, you can see that there's a defense uh, there, but uh, serving politicians charging for interviews, that's the, we're, we're going down a very uh, dangerous path there. Oh, come on, Tim, you're a libertarian. You'd love the idea of being able to market services. Well, our politicians should be, uh, and this has been a joke all throughout media appearances throughout the week, uh, uh, television and radio hosts have been saying, uh, up next we've got uh, free of charge uh, this minister. <laughs> uh, or my my crack at libertarians aside, Tim, it, it's interesting that they so easily resorted to the ad populum fallacy or everyone else is doing it. But in this case, I'm going to give them a pass on that simply because they are actually going to use the money for something good. They're not just getting rich off scandal or, you know, sensationalism, which is something that we at the Unshackled look down upon when the tabloid media do it. Um, actually, let me put my glasses on because I wrote a lot of notes uh, during the interview uh, because I wanted to have some points of reference. The Honestly, I actually don't have any problem with them selling their story in this case because it's not about, it's not about them. It's about the child, the circumstances and politics leading up to the birth of Sebastian notwithstanding. Uh, it's. I, I'd say that it's. Well, Barnaby Joyce is. He's. He's clearly on his way out. I mean, there. There was talk uh, when he resigned as deputy prime minister. He might become leader again one day. But I think that's well, uh, well and truly not going to be uh, possible. So I think that the fact that he is on his way out does make it. Uh, I'd say more uh, justified. I mean, everyone's brought up that uh, uh, Bob Hawke and uh, Blanche Chipok uh, sold their story to, to Women's Day. That's when uh, Bob Hawke was was out of uh, Parliament. But yeah, I think that the the key thing is is serving uh, politicians. And it's interesting that the ministerial guidelines bans ministers from doing this, but uh, not backbenchers. Mm. Well, ministers of the Crown have a responsibility to not only their constituents, but to the Crown as well, whereas a backbencher only has a responsibility to the electorate. 
Uh, it's also interesting to note, Tim, and we'll probably touch on this later on during this discussion, that Barnaby made quite a few um, rather candid comments about some of his form, uh, some of his colleagues in regards to pressures that they did put on um, Vicky Campion to terminate the pregnancy. Yeah, and she was almost earlier on in the pregnancy going to ter terminate it herself. Eh? She described how she bought the abortion drug uh, AU486 and, and had it on the, uh, the, the shelf. And obviously Barnaby has been uh, pro-life uh, all throughout his career, but said at the end of the day, I was still going to uh, support uh, uh, what uh, Vicky did and and yeah she did reflect on the fact that you know uh, Seb uh, as they as they called him is going to be watching watching this in, in, in the future but I think yeah well obviously they had to disclose all of that because Channel 7 wanted to get their money's worth but I think at the end of the day it was good that she did and also I think uh, Barnaby uh, was glad that yeah they they did uh, go through with the pregnancy and yeah uh, it's uh, I think you know, throughout all of this uh, scandal as Channel 7 sensationally called it uh, t uh, tonight nobody ever wished the child any ill will I mean the initial reaction to the uh, the, the breaking of the story that uh, Vicky Campion was pregnant was um, that, that it was a private matter. It, the reason it became politically charged is because, and this wasn't talked about in the interview at all, the, the fact that Vicky Campion was moved from office to office. That, that was what brought Joyce down in the end, but it wasn't talked about. Mm -hmm. That's right. There are a lot of people who are saying, oh, she should be, oh, Barnaby should be sacked because he had an affair. And then you had other people who were avid fans of Barnaby saying, oh, look, he's human, he just makes mistakes. My position was obviously a lot more nuanced than that. My position was that if the allegations of his mistress receiving beneficial treatment or preferential treatment from the government in terms of employment, that was a misappropriation. That was grounds for misconduct and dismissal, but not having the affair in of itself. That was always my position that I took. So when people say, oh, Barnaby should be sacked because he's morally deficient. I said, well, no, because most politicians have affairs. They just don't get found out. But the reason, it's where, yeah, that, but that sorry, was but, uh, another reason why this was so scandalous. The fact that Barnaby Joyce was a, f a family values uh, a politician, the, the, mm. the uh, the, the fact that yeah he'd been a, a campaigner against same-sex marriage for uh, for quite a while and uh, there was it was a view of a lot of people that he wasn't practicing uh, uh, what he what he preached and yes we we all uh, stuff up uh, you know not all marriages last but when you the the deputy prime minister and your marriage ends in that sensational way then I think criticism is warranted. Mm -hmm. oh, critic criticism of his moral failings, sure, but not necessarily of his conduct as a Minister of the Crown. And that was the point I was making to a lot of people who were arguing for, no, no, he should stay, he's only human, versus the people saying, nah, he's morally deficient, sack him. It's like, well, it's a lot more complicated than that. Yeah. As I said before. Mm. Yeah. I, I, yeah. As I was saying as well, it, it was, the, and this is only when Labour started to go after him because of the, the moving around. Uh, initially, when the story broke, uh, uh, Labour uh, MPs were saying it was a private matter, and uh, one in particular, uh, Tony Burke, also said that. Uh, of uh, course he did, Tim. And we all know why. Yes, yes. He had an affair with his staffer. Mm. And he's now married to her, if I recall correctly. Yep, yep, you're recalling right. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, also they they didn't name uh, any uh, politicians in particular. There was no airing of the uh, political uh, dirty laundry. Uh, there was a lot of people saying that by doing this interview, he's digging up the the the, uh, the controversy again. Uh, why would you do that? I mean, uh, another justification was you know we've tried to be private about it, and uh, people have been following us everywhere, so we may as well just. Uh, uh, lay it all out but yeah it wasn't a political interview I didn't see like 
Barnaby the 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 politician. It was it was just him and and Vicky describing their relationship. Now I don't like I like obviously when when someone sort of like seen as the 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 home wrecker. Like I don't I also don't hold anything. I don't hold any ill will towards like Vicky. She's a she's a she's a person uh, as well. It was always about the the political. Uh, implications and yes I mean at the end of the day we, uh, we we all wish them the best and hope that this new arrangement uh, works hmm and that's an interesting point you raise actually I mean there were Vicky Campion did cop a lot of heat and hatred in social media some of which was absolutely disgusting I mean, saying things like we hope your child is still born that's a horrible thing to say yeah. to someone even if you don't like them, that's a horrible thing to say. But the interesting thing that restored a little bit of my respect for Barnaby was the fact that he accepted unconditional culpability for this. And she, and Vicky tries to say, oh, no, look, we both did this. I was like, well, no, I'm not going to have you painted as some scarlet woman. The decision was made by me to start this so basically he he didn't say it in so many words but he basically indicated that he was the one who made the first move in regards to that uh, very early in the beginning of the interview yes you remember he he suggested that they their affair became a thing because of the proximity because he was too far removed from his wife and family for him to uh, be a good family man yeah, and, and he also, so the proximity factor was what was the biggest catalyst of the affair. And he seemed to imply that his marriage was already uh, on the rocks. I mean, he he did his best there to dodge the questions about his uh, conversations with with Nat, uh, uh, his wife, and uh, the interviewer did well to like press Vicky about you know what was the the confrontation like with with her. We can only imagine because let's remember that uh, Barnaby was chucked out of the the the, the family home. Uh, so mm. um, uh, Channel Seven they didn't get any uh, insight. Uh, in there no they did not and you know even though Barnaby obviously has some conflicted feelings about his estranged wife he's not going to drag her through the mud I mean he's apologized to her publicly and privately of course Natalie has got every right and reason to hate Vicky regardless because I mean if you have a partner and they uh, if they perceive that partner should be stolen from you, then you're gonna bear some ill will towards them. So it's not surprising. But I'm actually, I'm actually surprised that the Channel Seven journalist didn't actually push him harder than he could have. It's mm -hmm. just the fact that Barnaby was able to absolutely say, "No, we are not going any further. That's it. This is how I stop the question." And look, I, I hope that now that Barnaby Joyce has done this tell all interview, and he did clarify what he said about the, the paternity that just... He, he, his excuse was that he was being asked uh, so many different questions and he, you know, st stuffed up one about the paternity and of course that became the story. Yeah, I, I, I can sort of see how that would have happened and how a journalist would have loved to uh, have enjoyed reporting that um, but mm. I think the main thing that needs to happen after this is Barnaby needs to move on I mean there was like obviously when uh, this this scandal was engulfing the entire country there was a lot of back and forth between him and the Prime Minister that wasn't it was touched upon briefly tonight I think just Barnaby please move on you know do something else raise your raise your son you know with Vicky and yeah we're, we're you know we'll wish you all the best mm, basically yes well surprisingly that wasn't the only uh political drama of the week uh one nation had a 
uh, we'd probably say another uh, spectacular implosion. This was over their New South Wales Senator Brian Burston uh, breaking uh, ranks with leader Pauline Hanson to vote for their Turnbull government's company tax cuts. Now, Pauline saw this as an act of defiance, betrayal, but Burston saw this sticking to his word because let's remember, Pauline, she tried to sort of weasel herself out out of this deal she made with supporting the, the company tax cuts, which wasn't uh, convincing. Now, Burston, he he didn't really want to leave One Nation, He but Pauline, she published that letter saying, I want you to resign from, from the Senate and resign as uh, Deputy Registered Officer of One Nation in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. and that's right. Um actually there's a lot more to it than is being reported by or being noted by both sides of the um burst and hansen stoush um <clears throat> excuse me um brian burston was actually interviewed by ben fordham on 2gb on friday i think it was, it was friday. no it was uh, i think this broke on the uh, it was on the Wednesday or Thursday evening. It was actually Ben Fornham has been filling in uh, on Sky News for Andrew Bolt, and that's where Pauline made her uh, teary, uh, f uh, uh, what, what would you call it? Uh, her, 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 her breakdown. Yeah, her she break was, she took it very personally. She felt personally betrayed by yeah. Brian, and, and I can understand why yeah. she felt and, that way, and, and even Bri if she did overreact. And Brian responded by ringing up Sky News to put his side of the story there. And hey, Brian Burston, he is trying to have the moral high ground here, saying, I didn't go back on my words. I still believe in, in Pauline and, and One Nation. And not surprisingly, he's uh, said that the real culprit in all of this uh, animosity is her chief of staff, uh, James Ashby, who, uh, of course, has uh, been at the centre of many controversies, both in One Nation and before One Nation. Oh, Ashby has fine form in terms of sowing and reaping discord within One Nation. I mean, the number of people who have left One Nation since Ashby took over as Pauline's chief of staff is, well, I need more than two hands to count, Tim, but I think you already know that. Um, I beg your pardon, you are correct, actually. I was talking about the Ben Fordham interview on 2GB on the Friday, afternoon, uh, Friday morning, Friday afternoon, uh, which came after um, Ben Fordham's interview with Pauline on Thursday night on Sky, as you correctly said, um, because the rumours were going around that he tried to defect to Shooters, Fishers and Farmers. Burst and deny this, of course, and took a massive dump on them in the process. So you, um, who do you believe? Do you believe him or the Shooters? <laughs> um probably just out without that cackle actually um <laughs> sorry the it's it's hard to say okay first of all in regards to the um the decision to vote against pauline in favor of the government company tax cuts that were being proposed he uh, for for, re for reasons and sources i can't divulge Burston did actually agree to back Pauline after she made the decision to withdraw her support for the government. I did actually point out to a friend of mine today that the whole schmozzle, not with the shooters and fishers and farmers, but with the actual company tax cuts could have been done by Senator Burston saying, I will vote as we agreed. This is to the coalition, of course. I will vote as we agreed, but you need to start acting on Pauline's conditions and make obvious moves that you are, otherwise I can't. And like I said last week, one of the reasons why Pauline reneged on her support for the company tax cuts is because the government, the coalition government wasn't doing enough to take action on her pet causes, I guess you could say. And, you know, I mean, I gave her credit for that because it's a, I've been critical of Pauline in the past for not actually using her clout in the Senate to influence policy. And now she's finally stepping up to the plate. 
granted later than I would have liked, but she's actually stepping up to the plate and good on her for doing that. But in regards to um, Burston's decision, Burston's claim that he gave this gentleman's agreement to Corman and others, that's only part of it. Like I said, I can't go into the details, but Brian did actually privately agree with Pauline to prior to her dismissal of him as the party whip, by the way, of um, to actually support uh, Pauline's change of heart or change of mind on the company tax cuts. Now, as for the uh, shooter suspicious and farmers thing, because uh, I don't know if you listened to the interview that Ben Fordham did on the radio for 2GB on Friday. Uh, ben Fordham actually read out the please resign letter. <laughs> First of all, it's please explain, then it's please resign. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, um, the letter that Pauline had sent to Brian. And Bri- um, Ben Fordham actually took a very balanced approach, a very level approach, very middle of the road approach, you could say. And what he said was, it seems like you and Pauline are both kind of telling the truth because there was what Ben Fordham has said, and I have confirmed this with some other sources as being correct. Brian himself did not make an overture to the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers, but one of his constituents whom he was helping with another unrelated matter it took the liberty of sounding them out about it as it turns out shooters vicious and farmers wouldn't have brian anyway because they don't trust him uh, but <clears throat> excuse me but pauline before she verified the accuracy of the statements that came from someone inside the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers about, oh, Brian Burston approached us. She went off, she went off, lost her temper and broke down on national television. You know, if anything else, it shows that she's human. But at the same time, she overreacted. And I actually said this to a friend of mine who works as a junior advisor to One Nation she overreacted in a very big way before getting the facts. Yeah, I definitely agree that she completely overreacted. I mean, uh, uh, Brian Burston said that he doesn't want to resign. He still likes uh, Pauline. And uh, let's remember that the history uh, of Brian Burst in One Nation. He's been there since the, the beginning, since 1997. And uh, Pauline did allude to the, the fact that uh, Brian once uh, stabbed her in the back. This was over uh, da- when David Oldfield. Oldfield was involved yeah. in One Nation, mm-hmm. New South Wales. And yeah, so I definitely think that Pauline has blown this up herself. And there's been a lot of people who've dragged up the statistic that uh, 23 uh, serving MPs have either uh, been uh, left or been expelled or uh, gone from the parliament uh, as uh, One Nation members. And of course, the most recent one was Fraser Anning, who uh, resigned only hours after taking his uh, Senate seat because uh, Pauline wanted him to resign so Malcolm Roberts could return. Mm, That's correct. And also bear in mind, like Brian Fraser and Pauline had been friends for well yes, over 20 yes. years. Exactly the well. same circumstance. Mm. And in fact, Fraser and Pauline never had the same kind of falling out that she and Brian had had over David Oldfield in the early 2000s. So the thing that most interested me in regards to, because I only, I didn't see the whole interview because i don't have cable at the moment but the thing that interested me the most is when pauline was breaking down she started lashing out at cullerton and anning as if they were just riding on her coattails now people need to remember she defended cullerton for quite a while before he was found to be ineligible under another um criterion of the constitution another subclause of the constitution not actually the bankruptcy thing which 
may or may not have merit, but that's another discussion for another time when I've collected more information on that. It was At because rate, he'd been convicted of an offence carry, carrying, carrying, uh, carrying more than one more year. Than months. Yeah, yeah, that's right. At the time, even though it was quashed afterwards, the High Court takes it when you nominate. If this is on your record, then you're out. Mm, that's right. So that was why Carlton was expelled, not the bankruptcy thing, which was the major motivator prior to the High Court ruling on um, eligibility. Um, what were we saying? We were talking about, that's right, the fact that Pauline, after she felt so betrayed by Burston, she lashed out at other people that she thought had personally betrayed her as well and demonised them on national TV. And I can imagine that they wouldn't have taken that very well, either of them. So, look, I'm not going to criticise Pauline for how she's acted over the past week. That's not my place. And even if it were, I wouldn't do that. Like I said to my friend that I was talking to today, I would have done... I would have done it a lot differently in both Brian's case and in regards to Pauline because uh, Pauline overreacted way over the top. And a lot of people are now saying, is this the end for uh, Pauline Hanson's One Nation? And they've emphasised that it is Pauline Hanson's One Nation. She was recently made uh, president for president life. President for life. <laughs> yeah. Is this the end of One Nation Mark II? Uh, I, I don't think it is. I mean, Pauline, she she won a six-year uh, Senate term. She'll be around for a while, and when she's up again, there'll be uh, a large personal vote for her still. But certainly, it's it, it's a, it's another sign that uh, minor parties, they even after a big electoral victory, they can they can fall apart pretty easily. Mm, 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 exactly. Um, Ian Nelson, the former Queensland Treasurer of One Nation actually recounted how he jokingly gave her a Hitler salute once that clause had been proposed and then passed. Apparently, he said, apparently Pauline laughed about it and he said, I wasn't joking when I did that. Um, another friend of mine, not of um, Nelson's, but another friend of mine actually made the comment, the furious furoress in regards to the fact that she's president for life. And a lot of, and it, you would have noticed this. I'm sure you would have noticed it. I'm sure a lot of other people, even including our listeners, even those who support One Nation, would have noticed that there is a very strong cult of personality around Pauline. If you even question Pauline in some circles, you get attacked with a Calvinist Inquisition. It's just, wow. It's, you know, if the major parties had cults of personality like that, we'd be accused of, of having totalitarian parties running for government it the thing that the thing that concerns me about one nation is that because it's called pauline hansen's one nation that is the technical name of the party it's going to exist as long as pauline hansen is around regardless of how many people leave her desert her or how many people are burned by her there will always be more people to rise up and take their places hmm. in terms of being loyal seconds, loyal lieutenants and such. So, no, I don't think it's the end of One Nation either, and I don't think it's going to be the end of One Nation. I mean, the establishment politicians and establishment media have been predicting that for years. I, I mean, mean, yeah, when Pauline herself does move on, that will definitely be the end. I mean, it was, it w it was nothing without her when she was out of the party and will be... Uh, when uh, she inevitably re retires or uh, moves on. Mm. Mm, that's exactly right. I mean, you could... Look, actually, that may not be the case. You'd have to drop the name Pauline Hansen's One Nation and just go back to One Nation, which is what she set up as the name of the party originally with the help of David Oldfield, her former... Carl Rove slash lover. Oh, Etrich. David Etrich was the other guy who helped um, David Oldfield and Pauline start up One Nation, which was just then One Nation. Um, 
and then they eventually had a falling out, obviously. Etridge tried to stand by Pauline as long as he could, but then he got put in jail as well. The only one I've ever who didn't get put in jail was David Oldfield. And so there's always been a theory of infiltration and subversion from the Liberal Party in regards to um, people who would get close to Pauline Hanson and work within the One Nation Party to... Uh, subvert it so it never becomes strong enough to run an actual uh, run a successful campaign and actually win enough seats to govern in its own right. Um, James Ashby, as you know, was an ex LNP staffer and was quite close to Mal Broth, the former Indigenous Affairs Minister under Howard. So there, there was there was a little bit of time I have to admit where I actually thought to myself. James Ashby is there to relegate Pauline to being controlled opposition. I actually have said this both publicly and privately to friends as well as family members and even political opponents. Wow, that was, that, that's quite the conspiracy theory there. Uh, I'm not sure if that... Well, David Oldfield... Well, I, I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but think about it. David Oldfield, ex-liberal. Brian Burston, ex-liberal. Pauline Plus, Hansen, oh, ex-liberal. Well, that too, actually. <laughs> that too, actually. And so that's where the thing sounds more like conspiracy theory than an actual conspiracy. But you know me, Tim. I'm a cynic. I'm always going to be skeptical of anyone who suddenly has a change of heart. It's like, yeah, One Nation, after they've been a Liberal Party shill for God knows how long. Well, let's turn our attention to another political uh, diva, uh, Jobs Minister Michaela Cash. Now, she's been under immense political pressure since her uh, staffer uh, resigned, uh, uh, David Degares, after he was apparently the, the one who tipped off the media that the federal police were raiding the Australian Workers' Union offices on behalf of the registered organizations uh, commission which is set up by the Turnbull government to basically investigate uh, union uh, corruption and now this was over a 10 year uh, old uh, donation that the AWU gave to uh, get up to see whether it was properly authorized now this was obviously it, it was a blatant political move to try and get Bill Shorten but because their Michaela Cash misled Parliament about the, the, the media tip-off, uh, the AWU have been in court uh, trying to get the, the ROC investigation uh, thrown out. So now she's been issued with a subpoena uh, for the federal court to give evidence. She's trying to get this subpoena set aside. And of course, all the legal bills are incurred by the, the taxpayers. And so there was a, a very uh, fiery media performance uh, by this week trying to uh, dog questions uh, uh, dodge, uh, dodge. Well, she's been dodging questions, not just to the media, but also at Senate me estimates uh, uh, as well. Which, which gave a, a very interesting uh, press conference and hi hid behind the the legal processes, trying to turn it back onto Bill Shorten, and yeah, it's it's just another distraction for the Turnbull government. Indeed, it is, and. <sighs> As much as I hate Get Up, and as much as I hate Trade Union Fat Cats, the A the AWU has a valid complaint here. I mean, leaking to the media, whether you did it yourself or whether your staffer took liberties and did it on their own whim, it still has the potential to prejudice a lawful and bitch investigation. And if you're doing that, then it's just going to be a pro then it's going to be a problem in terms of due process. I mean, I don't need to be a lawyer to say, look, in this case, the AWU has a point. And if the AU, AWU did do anything wrong by receiving a donation from GetUp, well, they'll get up scot-free as a result of the overzealousness of Senator Cash. Look, in, in all practicality, it probably was authorised properly, but I think what the the AWU has done here is said to the ROC, stuff you, we're not going to to, to, to give you the document, and so have basically uh, uh, basically smoked the, uh, the, the government out to come and raid their offices, and then it 
looks like a political witch hunt and it's played well perfectly uh, for them that the government looks mm. like it's basically engaged in uh, uh, some sort of, you know, using the, you know, jackbooted thugs of the, the government to go after their political enemies. Mm, it does look like that, doesn't it? And that's the biggest problem because if you have that stage where, um, if you're at that stage rather, where you have... Um, the Australian Federal Police or even just regular state police operating on orders or hearsay from the government, it doesn't look good. And then if you further decide to raid after the refusal of the AWU to hand over documents in regards to this, then it it dilutes, if not destroys the legitimacy of of the ROC. And of course, Michaela Cash, she, she hasn't had a good start to the year. Let's recall that she lashed out at a previous estimates hearing when she was asked by Labor Senator Doug Cameron about uh, a movement in her uh, s staff, which was which was related to the, the Prime Minister's newly announced uh, bonking ban and there was a few shifts around of staffers and she snapped and said I could name every uh, woman who works in Bill Shorten's office which I've heard rumours about which was totally uh, out of line and then uh, of course uh, after that there was the infamous uh, whiteboard incident when she was about to go into estimates and she was shielded by uh, a whiteboard by uh, the Department of Parliamentary uh, Services, which just looked uh, uh, farcical, and she just doesn't do well under pressure. I mean, she's been avoiding questions all week, as I mentioned before, from the media and in estimates, and uh, Senator Murray Watt for Labor uh, <laughs> decided to have a bit of fun with her, saying, are you able to answer what day it is, what time it is? Who are you? Yes, um, anyway. In regards to Michaela Cash's outbursts, in regards to Shorten and what she alluded to as women working in his office, that was also at the time of the Bunnaby Joyce scandal, which we touched on earlier tonight. The the senator is not known for being very patient. That's not to say she has a short fuse, but she's not known for being very patient. So when Doug Cameron, being his usual smart aleck self, decides to give her a bit of grief about Turnbull's bonking ban, then it's not surprising that she would, you know, try and shut him up by saying, oh, you want me to out all the women working in Sean's office that he might have had affairs with, for example. So that's actually not really surprising coming from her. It's, it still amazes me why is Turnbull uh, defending her and trying to still make a big deal about this uh, donation from the AWU to get up, which I think the average voter doesn't care, like unions giving money to a progressive organisation, you know, hold the front front page, like that, it's not like that, <laughs> that, that, that has, hasn't happened before, I mean, exactly. Uh, I mean, a strong Prime Minister would have easily cut somebody who's that damaged loose. The Turnbull's in a difficult position as well, Tim, because Turnbull only won by, what was it, five votes thereabouts? Ten, if five votes had gone the other way... Yeah, it was a ten-vote margin. He would have lost. Yeah, yeah ten-vote margin. So if five people had voted the other way, Abbott would have remained Prime Minister. Michaelia Cash was one of the people who backed Turnbull and, over Abbott. And she's from There's the also, faction as well. Mm -hmm. Well, well, the conservative faction, how do I put this politely? Uh, stuff, I'm not going to put it politely anymore. A lot of the conservative faction bitched out when it came to backing Abbott. They protect, they wanted to protect their own seats and their own electorates and their own salaries rather than have a leader that actually tried to stand up for the country, even if though, even though he was weak. So there are actually a lot of people at that time that I stopped talking to because they went against my advice. And I said, look, the party membership, the party faithful, they want Abbott to remain, not Turnbull. But certain MPs whom I will not name disregarded my advice and voted for Turnbull over Abbott anyway. It's like, well, screw you guys then. We're not friends anymore. But that aside, 
there's another reason potentially why Turnbull is defending Cash so uh, so insistently it, because of the fact that a she's a woman and b if he she doesn't support Turnbull she could in Turnbull's mind move her support from Turnbull to Bishop. So that's another reason two Western Australians, you know, they're going to get along a lot better than with Western uh, crazy hairdos. Also, yes. Well, regardless, the registered organisation commission, its credibility is shot, and it's pretty much dead. If if Labor gets in, uh, they're they're going to abolish it, and I don't think any future coalition government will bother. Uh, put, uh, putting it back in, given that it's caused uh, this uh, uh, this much of a distraction. Mm. Oh, it's been an absolute schmorzel. See, the Labor Party and the Liberal Party will always do this. Liberals bring in the ABCC, Labor abolishes it, Liberals reintroduce it, and then in this case, they also reintroduced, or they also introduced rather, the uh, Registered Organisations Commission. Labor will get rid of that. It's all about ideology about petty political point scoring. That's what it comes down to. So they will probably try again. Hopefully their points are more competent than cash this time or next time rather, because I still think Sean's going to win the next uh, federal election, barring a miracle for the Liberal Party and the National Party coalition or an absolute cataclysmic disaster for the Labor Party in terms of shorten. Shorten will be the next occupant of the lodge. We'll do an update on uh, Tommy Robinson, the the UK uh, anti-Islam and British values campaigner who was uh, imprisoned uh, after he was uh, arrested for uh, breaching the peace by live streaming outside a grooming uh, trial in Leeds, and this uh, breached a previous suspended sentence he'd got for uh, contempt of court for uh, filming a similar grooming trial. Also, he was summarily sentenced to 13 months in prison. There's been worldwide rallies uh, in support of uh, Tommy Robinson. There was one here where I am in Melbourne. There was another one in Sydney, Canberra, uh, Brisbane. There was one in Perth, even one uh, in Auckland. Uh, so Tommy is, is safe and alive for now, thank God. Um, but what's really concerned me is that many on the, the right are, are not defending him, especially um, those who have a legal background. For example, Janet Albertson, she said, well, you know, we, we, we can defend you know, Tommy's uh, a activism and right to free speech, but oh, he could have uh, prejudiced this trial by, uh, by, by filming outside, which I mean, let, let's be realistic. All this talk about prejudicing a trial. I mean, uh, do, do they really think that a jury is going to be uh, that, that they just shut themselves off from like all forms of media and like they're going to suddenly be corrupted because some activist is streaming outside of court? I mean, uh, what, what, what I think Albertson really means is that there's all these uh, legal eagles who are looking for, you know, the ultimate technicality and often judges buy it. They were like, oh, you've prejudiced the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the trial now. I'm going to let these groomers off. The only good thing that's come out of this debacle now is the fact that um, the gag orders yes. imposed by the court have now been lifted. Uh, there was uh, Ross Cameron, Rowan Dean, Lauren Southern, and Stefan Molyneux famously took the, the tape off their mouths on Outsiders uh, uh, when they when they could just finally discuss the uh, the trial. I've got Albertson's uh, article here where uh, she she says that um, if <clears throat> if you object to contempt of court laws, make that case. Well, yes, I will make that make that case because I think a lot of us. Are are sick of these sort of legal technicalities, which basically in the uh, the internet age and the well, it's media saturation age have uh, ha have no real real place. I mean, uh, jurors are still going to do what they uh, uh, what they want to do. I mean, it's not illegal to report on a trial. I mean. What, 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 what's supposed to happen is is that it, it, are the courts going to ban the reporting on any trial? 
Well, it does set a dangerous precedent for that. That gag order did set a dangerous precedent. Fortunately, it was overturned. That being said, though, there's no reason why they can't use that later on in the United Kingdom as a way of suppressing um, reporting on other trials, other grooming trials, especially, but even other non uh, non grooming related trials as well. And what, another thing that's disappointing me about some uh, on the right, uh, and I think Ben Shapiro was guilty of this, is they believe a lot of the misinformation uh, about Tommy Robinson. They, they believe that because he founded a street movement, the, the English Defence League, that it, you know, some sort of you know, fascist neo-Nazi organisation, which it wasn't. I mean, from the beginning they said, we're not affiliated with the British National Party or National Front. Our only concern is Islam and uh, British values. I mean, we, you know, we're critical of Islam here because you know we want to protect the the women, the the gays, the the, the Sikhs, and and all the other people. And Tommy's been quite consistent for that for uh, a number of years. I, I I don't I don't believe that you know Tommy at any time has been you know expressed you know sympathy with Nazism or anything like that. He's always been a civic nationalist. Hmm, that's that's mostly true. He was a co-founder. He did leave the EDL because he did see, to his dismay, that there were some neo-Nazi elements creeping well, it's, into it's, it. It's a street movement. Like, anyone can basically join in. That's the problem with such a movement. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing that makes it potentially strong is also the thing that makes it potentially dangerous and or potentially weak and unworkable. There was actually a um, comment made, speaking of Tommy Robinson, there was actually a comment made about, and I don't remember where I saw it. I think it was a, a conversation I was having with some other people about, is Tommy Robinson our guy for free speech or is he a controlled opposition agent or some, some stuff like that? Uh. I know, I know, I know. You, when, you, when, you've, when you have... When you have lots of people, you hear everything from extreme left to the extreme right, and you just you forget why you hear it, but you just hear it and you remember it like a safe in your head. You open it up and you can pull it out whenever. Or sometimes the safe opens automatically and just comes out in, in relation to the topic. But there was someone who was complaining, someone who th who takes the latter view that um, Tommy Robinson is a this controlled opposition, saying. He once got his black friends to beat up a guy who did a Hitler salute. I'm not sure if that's true or not. That could be just more smearing. I mean, a lot uh, of people who smear other people. Um, I can't get on, I mean, on board your conspiracy theories, Michael. I'm sorry. You're, it's not uh, my. No, 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 no. It's not my conspiracy theory. I don't care. I mean, you know, I actually probably like him a little bit more if, if that theory about him was true. If he did actually get a bunch of black guys to beat up some Nazi love, I probably actually like that. Um, what I'm saying is, in context, that in regards to the misinformation going around, I mean, there have been people who have said that he's controlled opposition. Some people have said he's an agent for some other group, some other forces. There are people who just say he's a straight up patriot. And there's some people who say he's a mortgage fraudster. And, you know, who do you listen to? you gotta, you got to weigh everything up in balance. Well, I think, you got to weigh up yeah. in balance. And, you know, I, I, much, I prefer Tommy Robinson, for example, compared to Ben Shapiro, who, well, let's face it, Ben Shapiro is very much part of the establishment. Tommy Robinson is not. Well, I definitely believe that all these rallies here in Australia, New Zealand and around the world, they have made an impact. I think the, the British government is on notice now that they've got to at least give Tommy a, a fair, or, we, or I, I shouldn't be too optimistic, but they've, they've basically got to look after him while he's in, in, in jail. And they know that if they attempt to you know, make him disappear, then it's, it, 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 it will basically... Uh, paint the uh, the UK in a very uh, neg a negative light. So uh, I'd like to thank all those people who uh, attended uh, those rallies, and I think it is uh, ma making a difference. And yeah, we'll we'll continue to uh, uh, pray in our thoughts with Tommy. Mm, absolutely.
Well, I appreciate you coming on the, the, the show again tonight, Michael, and also uh, watching the, the Barnaby Joyce uh, interview uh, with me. There, there's nothing quite like, uh, you know, having to watch something for, the, uh, for work. It's, it's always an interesting experience. It is indeed. It's, it can be quite cumbersome if it's not something you're very interested in. It's like, the story was six months ago, move on. But we already discussed that, so <laughs> no need to rehash. But it's a pleasure being here. Uh, well, uh, who knows what will make, make the news next week, but yep, uh, there'll be even more topics than uh, we can even hope to talk about. Absolutely. Well, Italy looks interesting as well, so we can talk about that as well. Yep, definitely. Take it easy. Night, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. There are more rallies for Tommy Robinson planned in Australia. They will be on Saturday the 9th of June. If you're in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth or Brisbane, please search Rallies for Tommy Robinson and Free Speech to get the date and location for the rally in your city. Tickets are on sale for the big tour by Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern in Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axomatic Events, so make sure to grab your place before they sell out by visiting Axomatic.events. Lauren and Stefan promised to make a big impact to our national discussion while they are here, so it is certainly shaping up to be an exciting tour. Axomatic is launching with a bang. If you're in Brisbane, you can meet the uh, famous Mama Warrior Against Unsafe Schools, Political Mosting Mama, aka Mareka Rancy, in person. She'll be appearing at the Mount Gravitz Bowls Club at 7 p.m. Thursday, the 21st of June. Tickets can be purchased by going to Axomatic dot event slash political posting mama the true blue cruise annual aussie pride flag march is nearly upon us it was one of the first events we covered out on the field in melbourne last year and we'll be back there again this year the date is sunday the 24th of june at 12 p.m and begins at the royal exhibition building it is so important that in this uh, current climate that we're in that these sort of events uh, take place so please come along and don't be deterred by the campaign against racism and fascism who always counter protest uh, this event. They've been sticking up their posters all around the city, inviting people to uh, protest against the Nazis and, and fascists. So it's important that this uh, narrative isn't allowed to suffice. Also, don't forget, if you want to take the Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards in the process, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. Also, don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.